Hey everybody, this is Russ from Metro Game Corps. I have another mini PC to review today. This one is called the B-Link SEI-8. Now I've reviewed a few PCs from B-Link over the past few months, so I'm going to call this one the third in a trilogy. And of the three mini PCs I reviewed from B-Link, this one is more firmly targeted towards a budget audience. And so we'll run it through its paces today and see whether or not it's worth that budget price. Let's talk about the specs really quick. This uses an 8th generation Intel Core i3 processor, as well as integrated graphics. It has 5 GHz Wi-Fi, an M.2 NVMe solid state drive, and it can be configured with up to 32 gigs of RAM. On top of that, it has dual 4K monitor support via two HDMI outputs. But one thing to note, at a 4K resolution, you're only gonna get 30 Hertz. Now on their website, they have two different specs. One goes for 399, the other goes for 499. But on Amazon, you can find it for about $360 with an additional $35 coupon, or about $375 for the high spec one. And over the past week, I've seen these prices fluctuate quite a bit. In fact, I've seen the high-end spec one go for as low as $350. And so to split the difference, I'm just gonna call this one a $350 mini PC. So going back to that trilogy concept, this is the SER3. This is the middle spec PC that I had reviewed a couple months ago. And this one has a Ryzen 7 chip and an all metal body, but costs a couple hundred dollars more than the one we're gonna review today. And if we bump up the price another hundred dollars, we're gonna have the GTI 11. I reviewed this one a few weeks ago, and I was really impressed with this one to the point where I thought this could actually be a capable standalone PC. But I think that these two devices are a different beast of their own, and so we'll do a comparison later on in this video, but for now, I'm going to stick to this one here. And so my goal with this review is to see whether or not at around $350, this is going to be worth picking up. And the results are a little bit mixed. Anyway, without any further delay, let's jump into it. Okay, let's start with a quick unboxing. Now, one of my favorite things about the B-Link products is that they do really good packaging. In addition to just having a really nice design and professional look to everything, they use minimal packaging. And so because of that, there's not a lot of waste in here. Inside, you'll find a user manual that doesn't have a ton of information, mostly just IO information. And then inside is the mini PC. And like I said, really tight packaging. I'm a big fan of that. Digging a bit deeper, you're gonna find the power brick, a mounting bracket and screws, as well as two HDMI cables. The shorter one is for when you mount it onto your monitor. In terms of power brick, this is the same one that ships with their other mini PCs. It's a pretty big brick, but all the same, it's not huge. Let's do a size comparison with the device itself. And as always, we'll compare it against a block of Kerrygold butter. And it looks to be about 16 ounces of butter altogether. It's quite a small PC. Okay, now let's take a look at the body of the PC itself. It has a bit of a reflective top to it, more on that later. And then on the front, we have some convenient I.O. We have two USB 3.0 ports, USB Type-C, headphone jack, and the power button. There's also a small reset button in case you need to clear your CMOS. Each side has some vents because this does have active cooling, as well as some more ventilation here on the back. In addition, we have gigabit ethernet, two more USB 3.0, two HDMI ports, and then the power plug. And that's about it around the sides. Not a lot going on at the bottom here, but I do like to mention the fact that B-Link prints the quick setting buttons right here on the bottom. I love that. I also love that the screws are not covered up by the pads, makes it super easy to get inside. Okay, jumping back to size comparison here, I did want to do a quick comparison against the SCR3 because it looks like they are the exact same size. In fact, I don't recommend it, but you could stack one on top of the other. In terms of overall design, I definitely prefer the SCR3 here. I just like this grill that's on top and on the sides. It kind of has an industrial look to it. And to me, it just looks a lot nicer on the desk. The all metal construction just feels really solid too. By contrast, the SEI8 here has just kind of a plasticky feel to it. Definitely not the end of the world. It's still a really nice design, but I prefer this metal industrial design on the Ryzen. In terms of weight, it is 360 grams, so fairly lightweight, especially when compared to the Ryzen PC. But the Ryzen actually has a solid state drive inside of it, so let me take that out, and it does go down quite a bit, but it's definitely still a lot heavier than the SEI 8, even with an additional hard drive. Now, the SEI 8 also has space for a SATA hard drive, so let's open it up and see what it's like inside. Getting the device apart is super easy, it's just four Phillips head screws. And one of the things I really like about B-Link is that they use name brand components. And it also uses a Kingston NVMe hard drive. And I'm testing with the higher spec PC, so 16 gigs of RAM and 500 gigs of storage. But I also want to add this SATA hard drive here. It's really easy, it's just a matter of clicking it in spot here. And it is a bit loose, so we are going to screw this one in using the silver screws here. And this also is a super simple process. Okay, and now we're ready to rock. Let's put this back together and start testing it out. I'm just going to kind of gloss over the reassembly part because you know how this works. 
But yeah, overall, I'm pretty impressed with this hardware. It's lightweight and it's easy to put a hard drive in. It just has a really professional build quality to it. Okay, one thing I forgot to show is that it did have a piece of plastic covering the top here. And so when I took that off, it got a lot more reflective and it had a deeper black to it. But on top of that, it immediately started picking up my fingerprints on the top. And unfortunately, because of the type of material they used up top here, it actually has these little ridges at the top and you can't rub these fingerprints away. And so unfortunately, I think over time, you're just going to get more and more fingerprints on this thing. And it's really kind of unsightly. Anyway, this is what it's going to look like on your desk all hooked up. One thing to note is that all of the USB plugs are upside down. Okay, let's jump into the actual software now. Looking at the specs, it matches everything on their website, so good to go there. Just to mention here, it does have Windows 10 Pro, not Windows 10 Home. And if we do a PC health check, we can see that it is ready for Windows 11. So bonus there when it comes to longevity. Now, I prefer to use 1080p for most of these videos, but all the same, let's bump it up to 4K and do some video playback testing. So I'm going to grab my typical 4K test file here on YouTube, turn on Stats for Nerds, and then bump up the specs to 4K as well. Now the major thing I'm looking for here is how many drop frames we have, and you can see up top we have 16 drop frames among thousands. So in terms of video playback, this should be a capable device. But let me mention it one more time, when you do play this in 4K, it's only showing 30 frames per second. And since most modern 4K TVs can run at 60 Hz, this is quite a bit of a downside, and I don't like the fact that they even advertise the 4K and not mention the 30 Hz on their website. So I would say consider this mostly a 1080p device, and if you do want to bump it up to 4K, just know what you're getting into with only 30 frames per second. Okay, I'm going to do a quick stress test here just to look at thermals. Now the TDP is set for 28 watts on this device, and as you can see here at max load, it bumps up to about 25 watts altogether. And really, that's not bad, all things considered. But one thing that did impress me is the fact that the temperature on this stayed below 90 degrees even at max load for several minutes. And so that's a really great sign that the thermals on this work pretty good. And on top of that, the fan speed is actually significantly lower than a lot of the other mini PCs I've tested. Now, I don't have a way of testing fan noise, but all the same, let me show you some footage here so you can hear what it sounds like. So yeah, even at max fan speed, not too bad. So let's talk about gaming. I'm going to start with PC gaming and then we'll move into emulation. And across the board, most of your light gaming needs will be covered with this device. Now this is at 1080p resolution, and I also found that if I turn VSync on, it would dip down to about 30 frames per second. So for the most part, I had to turn VSync off in order to get good graphics. And when it came to 2D games, things like Ori and the Will of the Wisps, or Dead Souls, or Horizon Chase, all of these were fine, no issues when it came to screen tearing or anything. So I'd say overall, when it comes to low-spec light gaming on 2D games, you should be okay. However, if you bump it up to 3D games, things like Halo 4, you can see a ton of screen tearing with the V-Sync off, to the point where it's kind of nauseating. Now, it works just fine with V-Sync on, but it is going to limit the frame rate to about 30 frames per second. That being said, it's a stable 30, and so it's not the end of the world. In fact, it reminds me a lot of like just playing on an Xbox 360. So I'd say if you're a big fan of 3D-based games, this one's not going to be a great deal, but if you just want to play casual platformers, 2D games, this should be okay on the PC side. So we'll jump right into some of the harder emulators. We'll start with PS2. For the most part, I would say 75% of games played at full speed on PS2 with the native resolution, so no upscaling or anything else like that. But at the very least, most of your favorite games are going to play okay. I'd be comfortable at saying that all the way up to, say, the first God of War are going to be okay, and that to me is about 75% of the game catalog. Now if you try to play some of the harder to run games, things like God of War 2, you're going to get an obvious dip in frame rate down to about 55, but sometimes down as low as 52 frames per second. And you're definitely going to feel that dip when you're playing. And then other games that have a longer draw distance, things like Ratchet and Clank, they're going to be all the way down in the 40s. To me, Ratchet and Clank is unplayable, but God of War 2, you could get by. Okay, moving over to GameCube, in the Dolphin emulator itself, I did have to turn off VSync in order to get good gameplay. But as you can see, at a native resolution, F0GX plays just fine. And many of the other games actually could bump all the way up to 1080p and worked really well. That being said, the lack of VSync does make an issue here. For example, with Mario Kart, you can see a little bit of tearing at the bottom of the screen. And same thing with Mortal Kombat Deadly Alliance around the middle of the screen too. Other games like Star Fox Assault didn't have any tearing issues at all, actually this one was pretty fun to play. And unfortunately Metroid Prime was probably the worst when it came to screen tearing. And this one also had a little bit of slowdown as well, but it was the screen tearing that really did me in. 
Now, just to give you an example, let me turn on VSync just so you can get an idea of what it's like with VSync on. Now, I'm running this at 1080p resolution, but even running it at a native resolution, I would get about 24 to 30 frames per second. And while the game looks nice and smooth at this point, it's just unplayably slow. So this whole screen tearing thing was starting to drive me nuts, and so I did a couple different things to see if I could fix it. For example, I went onto Intel's website and updated the graphics drivers, and did the same thing within the Windows hardware settings as well. But unfortunately, even with the most updated graphics drivers, which were updated even just a month ago, it still was having issues. And this was kind of one of the most unfortunate things about testing emulation on this device, especially on the PC side. Because it kind of turns into a lottery. You don't really know which GameCube games are going to give you screen tearing and make you nauseated, while the other ones will be just fine. And I didn't like the hit and miss aspect of the emulation on the PC side. Now because 1080p was running so well with GameCube, I decided to try out Wii U and see how that worked. And the results were mixed on this one as well. Some games, especially the 2D ones like New Super Mario Bros. Wii U, it would actually run at a native resolution with VSync off at a full frame rate. So this one is completely playable. You get a little bit of screen tearing, but it wasn't terrible. But then unfortunately, something like Mario Kart 8 also would run at just about full speed, but did have quite a bit of screen tearing. I'll let you call it on this one, but for me, I didn't enjoy playing it with VSync off. And unfortunately, turning on the VSync does render it almost useless. We're getting about 24 frames per second. And same thing with Legend of Zelda Wind Waker. With the VSync on, we're getting about 24 frames per second. And yeah, turning VSync off does run at full frame rate, but the screen tearing on this one was really bad. And unfortunately, I think this just kind of comes with the territory with this Intel graphics card. It doesn't matter what graphics backend you use, you're just going to have to deal with screen tearing with any 3D game that has VSync off. And that's kind of frustrating. Now this device also supports Linux operating systems, so we're going to boot into recovery options, and then I'm going to use my USB flash drive, which has been loaded up with the Bodicera Linux operating system. And we'll see how that works. And I have a whole video on how to set all this up and I'll leave it in the video description. But I will say that it worked perfectly. It was actually super easy to set up. And on top of that, it felt super zippy and fast. And part of that might be thanks to the 16 gigs of RAM that I have installed on here. But either way, this was a joy to navigate. Now, navigation aside, let's actually test out some games. We'll start with Super Nintendo here. Running the SNEX 9X current core, it's running just fine. 60 frames per second. It looks beautiful, plays really well. And in fact, this device has enough oomph to it to allow you to turn on the BSNES core for even more accuracy. So when it comes to Super Nintendo, this is beautiful. Moving forward, let's try out some arcade in case you want to use this as an arcade box. And yeah, your 2D games, your CPS 2 and 3, they're all going to work fine. And you can bump it up to something like Killer Instincts running at a full frame rate. And you can even run the Tekken games, no problem. So this is a pretty capable arcade machine all the way up through the late 90s. Moving over to Nintendo 64, this also was just about flawless 1080p upscale here with F0X and it's running beautifully. I would say in general you can leave 1080p as the default resolution here and it's going to run just great. And thankfully we have no issues when it comes to screen tearing with this core at all. So yeah, I would say this is a more than capable Nintendo 64 emulation machine. This is actually running really well. And I think for the very hard games, things like GoldenEye 007, your best bet is to lower the resolution down to 720p. It's still going to look fantastic and you're going to get a really smooth frame rate. You might see a couple dips here and there or maybe some audio stutters, but I think 720p is going to be the way to go when it comes to games like GoldenEye or Conker's Bad for Day. Moving over to PS1, we're going to use the Duck Station core within Retroarch, and we're going to upscale it up to 1080p. And as you can see, it's running beautifully. So I think without question, every single PS1 game is going to be able to play at 1080p, no problem. Moving over to Sega Saturn, still on Retroarch here, we're going to use the Yabasan Shiro core. And I'm going to leave everything at the original resolution. I kind of like to have these chunky pixels when it comes to Sega Saturn. And it's running just great. I would say that 100% of Sega Saturn games are going to play at full speed here. And again, like with Nintendo 64, this is a very capable Sega Saturn machine. So I'm getting pretty excited here. Let's keep pushing. Let's go over to Dreamcast. Again, I'm going to stay in Retroarch. I think that the Retroarch cores seem to work best with this machine. Maybe it's just the graphics drivers are really tuned in with Retroarch. But either way, we're going to use the Flycast core here, upscaling to 1080p. And across the board, Dreamcast was also flawless. In fact, I was having so much fun with Retroarch here running Dreamcast. Everything looked just so nice and accurate that I ended up playing this for over an hour. Like I ended up testing way more games than I usually would. And so yeah, I think it goes without saying that Dreamcast is great on this one too. And usually NBA 2K2 is the one that always gives me problems. But as you can see here, 1080p running at 60 frames, super smooth. 
So let's move over to PlayStation Portable. This one also runs at 1080p, no problem. You can even run the God of War games and have no issues altogether. So if you're keeping a tally here, that means Nintendo 64, Sega Saturn, Dreamcast, and PSP can all play at full specs 1080p resolution with zero issues across the board. I was a little nervous about trying GameCube, but it turns out that this one's really great for GameCube too. No screen tearing, and I can also upscale to 1080p resolution. And after having all those issues with the screen tearing, it just felt so good to jump into Metroid Prime and have no issues altogether. NF-Zero GX also plays at 1080p with no problem. And I even tried out my best friend ETA Prime's favorite game here, Auto Modelista. This one worked out just fine. Now it turns out this game is terrible, like it's super hard to control, but all the same, it does run really nice and I do like these cell shaded graphics. Moving over to Wii, I did bump it down to 720p resolution and it is running just fine when it comes to Mario Kart. However, some games did get slowdown. For example, Tatsunoko vs. Capcom did have some slowdown anytime I used like the big move from Ryu. Okay, keeping it within the Nintendo world here, let's bump it up to Wii U and test this one out. Mario Kart 8 seemed to run fairly well. It didn't get up to 60 frames per second, but it would get at least over 30, so it was at least playable. And there was a bit of screen tearing, but not enough to really distract me. However, moving on to something like Super Mario 3D World, the screen tearing on this was pretty terrible, to the point where I wouldn't really recommend playing this. But other than that, it actually ran pretty smooth. In fact, it ran a little bit better than the Ryzen PC, which costs about $200 more than this one. But unfortunately, the screen tearing makes me not want to play it. And unfortunately, even some of the 2D games that I thought would be just fine, things like Shovel Knight, still had quite a bit of screen tearing. So unfortunately, I would say that Wii U is more miss than hit on this. And I didn't think it was going to be possible, but let's try out Breath of the Wild just in case. And yeah, it doesn't even get 10 frames per second. So unfortunately, I think that Breath of the Wild is going to be unplayable. Okay, so I think we flew a little bit too close to the sun when it comes to Wii U. Let's ratchet it back a little bit. Let's try out PS2. As you can see here, 1080p resolution and Final Fantasy X is playing just fine. Same thing with Tony Hawk Pro Skater 3. And surprisingly, even some of the games that I thought were going to be kind of hard to play, things like Metal Gear Solid 2 Substance, were just fine. In fact, I found that most games on the PS2 could play 1080p resolution and have very minimal hiccups. So things like Marvel Ultimate Alliance 2, no problem here, works just fine. And it does look like the Grand Theft Auto games are going to be playable too. I would get some frame rate dips down to sometimes around like 55 frames per second, but it was still super playable. In fact, the only game that had any problems for me was God of War 2. So this is an indication to me that 95% of the games on PS2 are going to run just fine, and probably 75% of them can do 1080p. And finally, let's try out OG Xbox. Now this is the Zemu emulator. Unfortunately, I can't show frames per second on this one just based on the emulator itself, but it does seem to be running really well. This is at a native resolution, but all the same, it seems to be running at full speed with Halo. And Soul Calibur 2 is definitely playing very close to full speed as well. So I think Xbox has some good potential here. A little bit of screen tearing, but overall this seems to be good too. Okay, we've been at this for quite a while. I had to do a lot of testing because of the screen tearing issues, but let's jump into what I like and what I don't like about this device. And as always, we'll start with what I like first. I think that as a $350 mini PC, this is going to do just fine for everyday tasks. So if you wanted to use this for light computing tasks, things like shopping, browsing, taxes, spreadsheets, all that's going to be fine. And video playback is really good too, but you have to bear in mind that you're only going to get 30 hertz at a 4K resolution. 1080p, 60 hertz will be just fine. When it comes to gaming, I think where it really shined was using it for Botticera, because that could play up to Generation 6 no problem. Things like PS2, GameCube, and Xbox were all really great, and everything below that was fantastic. Given the fact that this is such a small device, I was really surprised at how well it did with the cooling. On top of that, the fan noise was not bad at all. And overall, the build quality on all their products is really good, and this one is no different. But of course, no device is without flaws, so let's talk about the things I don't like about the SEI 8. So if I didn't make it readily apparent, the screen tearing that we found on a lot of the PC games and even the PC emulation was just terrible. It really feels like a missed opportunity because it seems like a lot of these games would play fine if we could just resolve the screen tearing issues. And overall, when it came to the PC side of gaming, everything just became kind of a gamble. I never really knew when I booted up a game, either an emulation or a PC game, whether or not I was going to make me nauseated. And unfortunately, this device does not come with any bare bones options. 
I do think that given the fact that this excels as a Bodicera machine, I think if they sold this with only the RAM installed and with no hard drive, and then drove down those costs, I think they would get more sales. And I have to say it, the top smudges are super distracting to me. I think if you had this behind a monitor or concealed in your desk somewhere, it's not going to be an issue at all. But all the same, the way I have mine set up, I couldn't help but notice those smudges all the time. Now comes the time for me to recommend whether or not I think this is worth buying. And I do think that despite its flaws, at $350, this is a pretty capable machine. When you compare it against something that costs upwards of $250, a J4125 device for example, you're getting a ton more bang for your buck. On top of that, within the B-Link ecosystem, like the trilogy of mini PCs that I've reviewed already, this one also gives you the most bang for your buck. So let's break that down by system so you understand what I'm talking about. Starting with the GTI 11, it costs $650, and it can do emulation all the way through Wii U, including Breath of the Wild, and it can do some medium spec 1080p PC gaming. And when it comes to being an everyday PC, it's an excellent option. To the point where if I didn't already have a gaming PC, I would have no problems using this one as my primary PC. Now if we drop that price down to the $525 SER3, we get some performance that's pretty close, right? Emulation can go up to Wii U but no Breath of the Wild, and you can do low spec 1080p gaming and even some medium spec gaming as well. And this one also works really well as an everyday PC, not quite as good as the GTI 11, but it's still capable. Now if we drop it a couple hundred dollars more to get to today's mini PC, this still has pretty capable emulation all the way up to some Wii U. Granted, I would fully recommend using it on the Botticera side instead of the Windows side, but all the same, the emulation on this is pretty good for the price. Now PC gaming does have some caveats. You can do 1080p low spec gaming, but it's only going to be reserved to mostly 2D games. And as an everyday PC, that's eh, decent. I think it would be good for kids or somebody who just really wants to use low spec stuff. But the thing is, the way that my brain operates, that I can't really imagine spending an additional $200 just to get a little bit more specs with the SCR3. And even then, the full $300 price difference, almost double the price just to get the better specs of the GTI 11, is not quite worth it for me either. And so, in that regard, I do think that this device is worth $350. That being said, it does come with some significant caveats. For example, you are going to have hit and miss gaming when it comes to PC games, and the emulation is really only worth it on the Botticera side. But if you wanted to use this for some light Windows tasks and then dual boot into Botticera, $350 is not a bad price. Anyway, let me know what you think in the comments below. $350, yay or nay? And as always, thanks for watching and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful and we will see you next time. Happy gaming.